Continuing education knows that at the end, students want to graduate and we can help them do that because we take the time to really listen to their needs and we understand all the different options that are available across the campus for them. We don't take a cookie cutter approach. We realize each student comes with their own story. So whether it's a part-time student looking to complete a degree program or someone just looking for online courses, we're there to connect them to the resources of the university. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the panel. My name is Molly Fitzpatrick, and I'm the moderator for this afternoon. Today is Thursday, April 11th. It's 3.15 p.m. This is session number 17988, and this session is called Counting Votes and Making Your Vote Count. By way of process, I'll do a quick introdu introduction of myself. We'll do a land acknowledgement, logistics, panel intro, and then we'll get to the fun part. So I'll breeze through this pretty quickly. I'm Molly Fitzpatrick. I'm the Boulder County Clerk and Recorder here in Boulder County. I was elected in 2018 and was reelected in 2022. As the County Clerk and Recorder, I oversee three divisions, motor vehicle, recording, and elections. So this topic is near and dear to my heart and I'm looking forward to the conversation today and looking to see, for even for myself, some of the best practices and thoughts that we can put into our own uh, process in elections. I also serve as the president of the Colorado County Clerks Association, and previously I served as the elections legislative co-chair for the Colorado County Clerks Association, where I focused on legislation and issues that would maximize voter accessibility, as well as security and transparency. So as someone, again, who spent my career looking at these issues, I'm excited to learn from these panelists today, as I know you all are as well. So before we get started, the University of Colorado honors and recognizes that the many contributions of indigenous peoples here in our state. CU Boulder acknowledges that, we, that it is located on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and many other Native American nations. Their forced removal from these territories has caused devastating and lasting impacts. While the University of Colorado can never undo or rectify the devastation wrought on indigenous peoples, we commit to improving and enhancing engagement with indigenous peoples and the issues locally and globally. We will do this by recognizing and amplify, amplifying the voices of indigenous CU Boulder students, staff, faculty, and their work, educating, conducting research, supporting student success, and integrating indigenous knowledge, consulting, engaging, and working collaboratively with tribal nations to enhance our ability to provide access and culturally sensitive support and to recruit, retain, and graduate Native American students in a climate that is inclusive and respective. respectful. So the final step before our panel begins, we want to talk about how Q&A is going to work for this um, panel. So we will reserve time at the end for questions from the audience. So. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and we have two uh, fabulous student uh, producers. Can you raise your hand or stand up? Okay, perfect. Um, in the back, and they are going to be collecting those note cards and bringing them up to me. So for the last 15 minutes, we'll prioritize your questions. Please write legibly. If you are a student, please write student on your note card, because we are going to prioritize you, of course. Um, and please make sure that your questions are brief and to the point and um, I will not be able to get all of the questions that you submit um, to the panel, but uh, I will do my best to combine similar questions. So with that said, we'll now go on to introductions and then I'll be able to pass it off to our panelists, which is the main reason that you're here today. So I'd like to start with our own representative, Junie Joseph. Um, representative Joseph serves as a member of the Colorado House of Representatives for the 10th district, which is the city of Boulder. Uh, Junie, uh, Representative Joseph, who's also a friend, that's why I uh, am so casual with her name, but Representative Joseph was uh, born in Haiti and immigrated to the United States when she was 14, and she uh, attended CU Boulder School of Law, ran for Boulder City Council as a first-time candidate, and was successful. She spent four years on City Council, and after that, she started her own family law firm, and ran a campaign for Colorado's House District 10 and won. So she is now a freshman legislator, passing bills for tenant rights, child, we child welfare rights, and environmental uh, conservation. So that's Representative Joseph, so we'll welcome her to the stage. <laughs> 
and next we have Lisa Graves. Lisa is the executive director of True North Research, which is an investigative watchdog group that works to uncover dark money and politics. She has worked with the Department of Justice as her role as chief counsel for nominations to the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee. And she's really uh, become a national leading figure in uncovering the dark money influencing our democracy. You recognize her, probably because she is on a frequent contributor to CNN or MSNBC. And I also saw that you were in a documentary with America Ferreira, which is the coolest thing ever. Um, <laughs> she was so, wonderful. <laughs> she's what? She's wonderful. Yes, she's wonderful. I, I would imagine so. So that's Lisa. So we'll welcome Lisa. <laughs> And then we've got Ian Milheiser. He's a senior correspondent at Vox and specializes in reporting on the Supreme Court, constitutional issues, and the erosion of liberal democracy in the U.S. He was formerly a columnist at Think Progress and has clerked for Judge Eric Clay on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth uh, Circuit, was a Teach for America um, uh, participant in the Mississippi, Mississippi Delta, and has authored two books, which I think sound incredibly interesting, uh, Injustices, the Supreme Court's History on Comforting the comfort Comfortable and Afflicting the Afflicted, and The Agenda, How a Republican Supreme Court is Reshaping America. So welcome, Ian. <laughs> and last is Max Towie. He is the CEO and co-founder of Roka News, which is a digital news platform reshaping news consumption for young people. Um, he has amassed 4.9 million followers on this platform um, across various social media platforms, um, apps, and newsletters, and it's becoming one of the fastest uh, growing news companies in the country. He's raised nearly, uh, or over $5.5 million from mission-aligned investors, which is very cool, and he combines informative and comedic content on his personal TikTok with a, per with a following of 735,000, which is amazing. So welcome, Max. Thank you. Great, so we'll start with some opening remarks on this topic. Each panelist will have about three minutes to respond and I'll flash a note card if you kind of start getting close to that. But we'll start with opening remarks. Um, Representative Joseph, would you like to start with um, some opening remarks on the, the topic of how can we put voter confidence, respect, civility, and trust back into our democratic elections? Yeah, thank you for that question and it's a delight to be here with all of you. And yes, that's a really, really important topic for me as an elected official as well. And when I think about how do we put voter confidence, respect, civility into our democratic process or election process, we have to think about transparency and how do we ensure secure election processes. Uh, voter registration is very important. In some states, we don't do mail ballots, but in the state of Colorado, we do that which is great. People have their ballots, they, can, they have them for a while, for almost four weeks they have it with them. So that gives them an, an opportunity as well to fill it out at their own time and also do a lot of research. So that's very important. Um, also we have to make sure that we get the results out very quickly. That's also part of voter confidence because if it's taken a long time to count ballots, people are wondering what's going on. So it's very important that we also ensure that. Um, also, we have to ensure that our election processes, people feel that it is secure. I know that in Colorado, we have a very, very uh, robust system, and we have a Molly Fitzpatrick, and we also have Jenna Griswold, who is a champion for our democracy, and they're working really hard. So again, it's being out there. And I know that Jenna, is, she does a really, really good job at educating our community. She's on TV, she is on social media, which is very important to a lot of our young people to let them know that, hey, our voting system is secure. Because again, if people don't feel that their voting processes are secure and safe, they're not gonna go out there and vote. Why vote? If you feel that your vote may not be counted or there might be issues with the process. So that's very important. Also, we have to do a lot of voter education. I am one of these elected officials that do a lot of, a lot of education when it comes to door knocking, uh, doing mail ballot, mail uh, information to my community members. So, and also you have a role to play as well as part of that process as community members, uh, reaching out to your neighbors, letting them know, hey, there's an election. Who, do, who, do you, who are you thinking of voting for? And also, we also have to do the work of reaching out to people who may not be aligned with us on some of these issues, because that's part of the work. Because as a legislator, I go out there in Denver and I do the work. And I come back to the community and I can't do it alone. 
I need your support in order to do this work. So I think it's very important that we educate one another into the process. And also, again, I think another part of it too is ensure uh, ethical leadership, make sure that our leaders who are involved, that they're not putting out false information out there to our electors. And there is some of that happening and we have to hold their feet to the fire. So that's all part of the process. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa, what thoughts do you have? Well, I really appreciate the chance to be on this panel uh, that I think is going to bring so many different perspectives about this issue forward. Um, my work is predominantly focused on who is trying to make it harder for Americans to vote, who is trying to disrupt elections, lie about elections, make false claims of fraud, and who's funding them, uh, who are the billionaires who are pushing this lie, which I call the big lucrative lie, not just the big lie, a big lie that helps them raise a lot of money in order to further their destructive um, efforts. Um, you know, part of that work has helped to uh, unmask Leonard Leo, the guy who helped pack the U.S. Supreme Court with these right-wing judges uh, determined to destroy our rights in numerous ways. But it's not just his work to fund uh, campaigns to install people who um, probably were chosen, in my view, because they would not be fair judges, but because they were sure votes. But he also has used those same vehicles to help launch a thing called the Honest Elections Project. In my view, it means the opposite, but it's another vehicle that he's used in the states to try to launder the big lie about the election being stolen in 2020 by saying that he supports or his entities support this honest elections project that then goes around the country to implement the specific types of legislative proposals that Donald Trump spoke about on January 6th. He didn't just say, we have to fight. He didn't just you know, incite that crowd. He also mapped out a set of changes to state uh, and local voting laws to make it harder for Americans to vote. And Honest Elections Project has been moving around the country to advance that. But it's not just Leonard Leo, it's his fellow uh, others who control billionaire fortunes like Dick Uline. He's the guy who became very wealthy through the Uline uh, packaging company, which had a lot of packages during during uh, the pandemic and COVID. And so his, his uh, billionaire status increased and he's used his money to inject well over $100 million into our electoral process, including helping to fund some of the groups that helped organize the events on January 6th, the precursor to that violent insurrection. One of the groups that Uline has established is a thing called Fair Courts America. Again, don't believe the name, it's all propaganda, uh, in my opinion. And uh, within that um, vehicle, he's launched a thing called Vote Ref. Vote Ref is going around the country trying to get the names and addresses and phone numbers, et cetera, of voters and publish those. Um, in, in many states, not every state, they have different rules for you know, how that information can be accessed, how it can be used. And in a number of states, there have been concerns that people who are subject to domestic violence orders might have their names unmasked, uh, that they might be tracked down by a stalker if their information is provided in that way. But that's of no matter, no concern to Dick Uline's billionaire operation to uh, you know, basically try in the, in the name of transparency to do something that actually might inhibit some people from registering to vote by fear that their information is exposed. Then you have Cleta Mitchell. Cleta Mitchell was famous for the so-called perfect call in Georgia where Trump was trying to demand that uh, 20,000, or you know, what the specific number of votes be found that he would somehow become president. Uh, Cleta Mitchell is a lawyer who I've been tracking for years because of her role in the Bradley Foundation, which has helped fuel a lot of these voter suppression groups, like a group that called itself True the Vote. Um, True the Vote was stood, uh, they stood them up in 2010, 2012, in order to go intimidate voters in Wisconsin and other places uh, to basically try to stand around in particularly minority districts, uh, places where there were a minority of African Americans, a majority of African Americans, uh, to intimidate voting. Bradley also funded a group that ran voter um, billboards, basically saying you're gonna be thrown in jail if you, if you uh, commit fraud, as if there is an actual demonstrable case of fraud. In fact, um, throughout uh, the past uh, you know, 20, nearly 25 years, this lie of voter fraud has been repeatedly um, put forward by Republicans. They did it when I was um, working for the Senate and they were trying to get these US attorneys to go along and make these claims of voter fraud. Then when they didn't play ball, a number of them got fired, you may remember that. They resurrected those lies again in the, in the 2010s, and then it came in you know, substantial way of these, in these past you know, four to seven years. And that, that lie has um, been used to really fuel a culture of violence in which election workers, in which election clerks have been subject to, to threats of violence and intimidation. And so I'll, I'll end here, I have more to say, but I'll just say um, 
the public officials who are working to defend our elections from that kind of intimidation, trying to make sure that everyone, no matter their party, has an opportunity to vote and have that vote be counted, they are heroes. And we have to do everything we can to stand with them against the culture of violence that some in this country are trying to perpetuate in order to steal elections through false claims of fraud. Thank you, Lisa. And as an election official, I feel fortunate to be in Colorado because we do have a community of folks who prioritize elections. That's why we have some of the most secure and accessible elections in the country because we have people looking at this and willing to advocate from different perspectives. We actually passed a law a couple years ago that now makes it illegal to use public information about election officials to then go threaten them or, or dox them. So I appreciate that um, sentiment that you brought to the conversation, Lisa. So Max, we'll go next to you. Well, first of all, thank you everyone for coming. It's wonderful to be here. I've never been to Boulder and it is beautiful. So some true advertising there. Uh, there are many brighter minds on this stage to discuss the legislative and, and legal aspects and constitutional wrinkles to this larger issue. But I want us to talk a little bit about how the media fans the flames that has led to such distrust of elections because I think it's true on both sides, not to engage in both sides of them. I don't think it's equal, but I think there is a level of distrust that each side has sown. For example, Fox News, we probably don't have to dig far to see what they've done to shed distrust on elections, even though, of course, it's all a charade. We saw that in the text messages and emails that were uncovered in the discovery process of the Dominion defamation case. But of course, they don't believe what they're saying, but it fans the flames, it, it makes people doubtful. And I also think there have been exaggerated claims of voter suppression. The 2020 election had one of the, I think the second highest turnout since 1900. A lot of the states where people bring up voter suppression and mention as a major issue, I'm not saying it's perfect, but the Georgia issue that, that the Biden administration investigated, North Carolina, Texas, they ended up having higher, uh, higher turnout in the windows of investigation than they did in previous. So I think there are a lot of positive trends to observe that are hopeful. The issue that I, that, that keeps coming to mind and I really don't know, and I hope there are some ideas here is, is to bridge the gap between young voters and the political offerings, but it's not just young voters. I mean, 49% of Americans identify as politically independent in 2004, that was 31%. And the majority of Americans thought were discontent with both options this year in the in the November election. So I think it's a bizarre moment of parties in the ballot not reflecting what people want. And I do feel as a younger person that a lot of the issues don't reflect the needs of younger people. I mean, you look at housing, you look at health care, you look at even larger cultural issues, the epidemics of anxiety, depression. I think we have major health problems in the country, 60% chronic illness, 72% obese or overweight. I mean, there are a lot of issues in the country, and I just think that a lot of politicians are always engaging in the culture war issues and not real substance. So I, I, I'm hoping that there's, and, and I, we can go, I'm, I, I will stop there, but I think there are so many issues too where you see the polling and there's a massive gap between what average, like the middle 70% of Americans want and what our laws are, whether that's on gun issues where most people support common sense reform and a number, sort of a basket of reforms, but it's not reflected in, in our policy. So I, I, I think there are a lot of different angles here and I'm eager to learn as I'm sure many of you are. Wonderful, thank you. Ian. All right, um, let me start off with a strong statement. The biggest threat to voting rights in the United States is the Constitution of the United States. Um, we have, you know, Donald Trump would not be a thing if, if we counted all presidential votes equally, if we had free and fair elections for the president. He should have lost the 2016 election by nearly three million votes, and it was only because of the Electoral College that we still have to deal with this man. Um, in the Senate, we have a Senate where each person in Wyoming gets 68 times more representation than each person in, in California. And this has had tremendous partisan I implications. So, you know, after the 2020 cycle, we had a 50-50 Senate. The 50 Democrats 
represented nearly 42 million more people than the 50 Republicans in that Senate. And this has been you know, a problem going back. You know, the previous Senate Republicans had a 53 to 47 majority. The uh, 53, Senate, uh, 53 re uh, Senator Republican majority represented 15 f million fewer people than the, min than the minority. Um, this problem is going to get worse. Um, by, there was a UVA analysis which found that by 2040, half the country is going to live in just eight states. So half the country gets 16% of the representation in the Senate, and the other half gets 84% of the representation in the Senate. That, that, that is not a democracy. Um, and this problem has been going on for a long time. If Senate seats were distributed proportionally, Republicans would not have had a majority in the United States Senate since the late 1990s. And that, of course, has tremendous implications for the one remaining branch of government, because, of course, we confirm our judges through the United, Sta th 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 through the United States Senate. There are three justices in American history who have been nominated by a president who lost the popular vote and confirmed by a block of, sen of senators who received less than half a, um, a, a, of the vote. They are Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, all three of Trump's justices. We have the least democratically legitimate Supreme Court than we have ever, that, that we have ever had. Well, that's not true. It used to be many people couldn't vote. But you know, we, we, we have a uniquely Ill illegitimate Supreme Court. And this is, of course, the court that gets to decide what the Voting Rights Act means or whether we're just going to repeal Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act for no particular reason. Um, this is the court that decided to delay Trump's um, election theft trial until after the election. You know, and so we have this cascading problem where we've decided, you know, I, I, I think that every problem in the, everything that we look back on with shame in American history has because we refuse to honor the principle of political equality. You know, we have, we, 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 we have refused to accept the fact that in a democracy, at least with respect to, to our politics, each person counts equally. And you know, that is the reason we still have to deal with Trump. That is the reason we have the court we have. That is the reason why even if Biden wins by a significant margin, he probably will not be get, able to get any legislation through because if you look at the Senate map, it is just awful for, it is just awful for Democrats. And until we face these core problems that again are written into our constitution, you know, I, I don't know how we are going to have a meaningful democracy. Thank you. So this next question is really geared for you, Max. So when we think about young voters, it's really important that young people have trust and faith in democracy and in the voting process. And I can say that in Boulder County, we actually just celebrated uh, High School Voter Registration Awareness Week last week, which is a holiday that our office made up a couple of years ago. Um, and it was really exciting because we were able to get the school districts involved and invested in ensuring that these students knew that in Colorado you can pre-register to vote. Here's how the mail ballot process works. And so it was really inspiring to see young people really get engaged in that process. Um, but at the same time, in talking to them and in you know looking at young voters' faith in institutions, it's quite sobering. Um, I read a quote from a uh, report out of the University of Cambridge that uh, where Dr. Robert Foe, I think is how you say his last name, said that this is the first generation in living memory where there is a global majority of young people who are dissatisfied with the way democracy works while in their 20s and 30s. And so that's really overwhelming, that's depressing. Um, so I'm curious in your work with Roka News, where do you see your organization fitting into that and shaping that conversation? Well, I think one reason there's such appetite for a company like Roka News is that young people don't feel that the either party represents them. After the panel, one of the panels yesterday, um, a young woman came up and talked about how I'm, you know, I'm left on this issue, right on this issue, and overall, I just hate politicians. Mm -hmm. And I think that summarizes a lot of. Um, the attitude toward young people in America, and I think, you know, for better or worse, they're gravitating toward candidates like RFK, 
Vivek Ramaswamy, Bernie Sanders, the longest serving political independent in congressional history. So I think there's a sense that there's what unites different factions because of course there is a very diverse Gen Z and young millennial voting block. But what unites, I think, is an anti-establishment sentiment. I think that is due to a feeling that D.C. is owned, that Big Pharma has spent $740 million on lobbying last year, that overall politicians sort of go through a metamorphosis when they head to D.C. where they start noble and starry-eyed and, yay, I'm going to change this thing and kick it into gear. And then with a couple years, their party line and, and simply speaking to the base and using hearings as performance opportunities. So I think there's such distrust of politicians and political platforms today. And I really don't know what the, I also think there's a bizarre thing going on where, um, you know, young people are like, hey, we want change, we want a new generation. And then this is the oldest Congress ever. And, uh, you know, this year we will be setting a record for the two oldest uh, nominees and they would have shattered the record they both set in 2020 so I think there's a weird vibe right now but I, I, I really don't know what structurally you could change I think there needs to be a revival of institutions at the community level I agree with everyone in this conference who who emphasized the importance of local politics and change at the local level so I hope that revival happens sort of from the ground up and I think there are a lot of more spiritual and cultural changes that need to take place before we see the downstream political effects. Great, thank you. And Lisa, curious if you would like to add anything onto that, and maybe um, Max started talking about some of the dark money in politics and what led to the formation of True North, which is a newer um, group. What gaps were you seeing and any other responses to Max's mm. reflections? Well, I really appreciate your perspective, Max, um, and I am definitely not of the same generation, mm. uh, so I appreciate hearing you know, what you have to say. Um, I, I think that one of the challenges is, and I, I see this happen on a regular basis with the Senate, is when something goes wrong, these senators say, we, we are not doing this. We, like they speak in this very uh, uh, you know, unusual language in which, in which they are, because of Senate rules and decorum, they're not actually saying, that guy over there is blocking this. They, they say, we can't, we're not able to, like they are in this we language. And in fact, what's happened, you know, when you look at the points of uh, agreement on policy issues, um, for the most part, those are, there's a lot of progressive agreement on issues. We should have a, a better minimum wage. This is ridiculous. We should have housing reform. People should get access to, you know, mortgages um, more easily or be able to have the rent translate into mortgages. People should get student loan debt relief. If we can give debt relief to corporations and wave away, um, you know, pandemic money, why can't we address this massive amount of, of debt? Well, what's happening is in two branches, um, with the U.S. Supreme Court being so captured, you have them, the court, stepping in and stopping measures that people are clamoring for that they want and that the law actually is written to support, uh, for example, with student debt relief. And you have a Congress uh, in which, because of uh, the factors that, uh, that Ian described in terms of the disproportion of the Senate uh, and the filibuster rule, you have the NRA being able to veto any of the common sense gun legislation that most young people think, you know, makes sense. And yet, we have not been able to translate effectively, in my view, who's blocking it. Instead, there's a pox on both their houses, there's this idea that both parties are super dysfunctional, that they're non-responsive, when in fact, I think from my perspective, when I track policy issues substantively, what you see is a lot of progress being made or a lot of efforts being made to address this populist agenda on the progressive end of the spectrum, and you have uh, just thwarting on gun policy, on access to health care, on repealing, repealing health care, on taking away abortion rights, uh, possibly limiting access to contraceptives. You know, so many issues you have a party, in my personal view, that is beholden to some very regressive couple of billionaires who want to impose their personal view as law, and they are thwarting the popular will. Now, that's not to say that Big Pharma is... Uh, is the good guy. You know, they have produced some medicines that are very effective. They produce some medicines that are not effective. And it's no, there's no doubt that they are playing a significant role in influencing Congress, just as the telecom industry is, just as the defense industry is. But in many ways, that influence is a product of the way this court has 
broken our electoral process through cases like Citizens United, which allow these special interests and the billionaires who really have gotten rich from some of these special interests to play a disproportionate role in our democracy. And so I feel like, I guess to go back to your original question, one of the reasons why I launched uh, True North Research and why I'm the president of the board of the Center for Media and Democracy which um, you know, operates PR Watch and Source Watch and Alec Exposed and uh, Exposed by CMD um, and Insurrection Exposed, they just keep popping up new websites. <laughs> but um, part of the reason I, I launched this is because I think people need to understand not just that there are problems, but who is standing in the way of fixing them. Otherwise it's like, oh, the economy, the economy doesn't work. Well, the economy is not the economy. As Annette Schenker Osorio talks about, it's a product of decisions by human beings. And because it's a product of decisions by human beings, human beings can solve this problem if we can exercise choice and power through our representative democracy, which we have serious problems, as Ian described, in accomplishing due to the malapportion of the Senate. Thank you, Lisa. And um, Representative Joseph, I'd like to get your perspective on this because I think uh, Lisa just painted a pretty stark and realistic honest picture of what's going on federally. Um, and so a lot of times we think, oh, at the local level, at the state level, there's a lot of hope. So we'd love to hear uh, what your re uh, reaction is to what Lisa said and um, what are the barriers? So Lisa illustrated some of the barriers nationally. What are some of the barriers at the state level to getting good things done for people in Colorado? Oh, wow, yeah, that's a great question. We're lucky here in Colorado because uh, we control both the House, the Senate, in the governor's office, so we have a trifecta. So the work, we can do just about anything we want to do, that's, that's what I believe, and a lot of us has done a lot of great work. But I think part of it is how do we empower our elected officials to do the work? As community members, there are people who are very, very active in, the, in this community as well. Boulder is mostly, well, we have a, a lot of Democrats, a lot of unaffiliated, very, very few Republicans. And if you would allow me to be partisan just for a minute, and, and I want to give you a good example. For instance, I ran a gun bill last year, and it was a ghost gun to prohibit ghost guns. And I did hear from some community members, but many of our community members I didn't hear from. The more progressive, more liberal colleague community members I have not heard from. But I did hear from people who did not want any restrictions on their Second Amendment rights. So again, when we're talking about how do we empower legislators to do their work, we need to hear from you. We need to hear from community members that, hey, you need to do the work. And we need to hear from a lot of you. Because if I'm hearing from a lot of community members who said, no, I don't want you to run this bill, yeah, I'm questioning whether I'm doing the right thing, but of course I know that I'm doing the right thing because I get my mandates from you, right? And th that's one of the values of the Democratic Party, which is um, gun violence prevention. But if I'm not hearing from you, it's making, me, it's, it's making me question whether, hey, do I have the support of my community to run this bill? So it's important to get your feedback. And I think another, something that Lisa mentioned as she was talking, I was reflecting on, is access to information. We have to make sure our community members have access to information. Access to information so that they can do the outreach. What is gun violence prevention? What are some of the methods? What are some of the legislations that could be brought forward? We have lobby days at the Capitol. I see a lot of community members, but there's a lot more I don't see. Where are they? They should be there at the Capitol lobbying for the things that are important to them. And also journalism. Journalism, it stands in the way of the work that we do. The way the news is being reported. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting because I see things on social media. Recently we passed a bill at the Capitol where I heard from some journalists after the bill passed. They said something along the line, the, the leaders at the Capitol are restriction, restricting First Amendment rights. Yet none of them reported on that before the passage of the bill. So I'm sitting there as a legislator thinking, wow, here is their assessment at the end, here's their conclusion of the impact of the bill. Yet none of them reported on that issue so that community members could come and reach out to us. So at the end of the day, 
the work that we do, there, there's many levers being pulled. You mentioned the millionaires and the billionaires that are very, very active at the legislature. They're making sure that we're passing the bills that they want, right? And then you have the journalists who somehow they're sitting at the Capitol as if they are a member of the legislature because they're not reporting on the news as they should in order to properly inform our community. Mm -hmm. So they play a role as well. And then you have the lobby group that also is almost a blocker to passing certain bills and certain issues. So again, I think it's the journalists or journalism, the way it's being reported, the news media, right? And also, I think there are things that we can't control as well as part of this process, right? We can't control social media. It's very hard to put any type of guardrails around false information. And that travels really fast as well. That really impacts how we do this work and whether it's good information. Again, it, when we talk about uh, erosion of trust and confidence in the work that we do, if people are seeing false information online, they don't know what, what's true and what's not true. So when a news article come out, should they trust that? Can they come to us and hold us accountable? Mm -hmm. Very unlikely because they don't know if that information is true. Mm -hmm. CU Boulder students, please go figure that out for us. <laughs> whether it's going into law, whether it's going into media, we need someone to figure out how to really make sure that it is truthful and accurate. And that's one of the biggest challenges that we see as local election officials too, is just the spread of misinformation and how quickly it gets out of hand. Um, and also thank you for the call to action. This is Boulder, so people like to know what they can do about these topics. So let Representative Joseph know what you think about her bills, get in contact with her, email her. She just made that request, so wanted to underscore that as well. Um, Ian, we'd like to, I'd like to go to an audience question um, for you. Is there any chance at removing the Electoral College? <laughs> there, there, is, there is something called the National, the, the, the National Popular Vote Compact, which is the, 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 the way that the mechanism works is that you get a block of states that add up to 270 votes and you get them to all agree that they will give all of their electoral votes to whoever wins the national popular vote. Um, and so the idea is that would effectively neutralize the Electoral College. The problem with it, I mean, I don't think it's unconstitutional. I don't think there's a serious argument that it's unconstitutional. The problem with it is that the Republican Party controls the Supreme Court. And if you had a situation where Joe Biden wins the popular vote, the national popular vote compact is, is in effect, and Donald Trump would have won the Electoral College without it, the Supreme Court will just declare it unconstitutional. And, and what I'm worried about is that the way that it would play out is they would wait until after an election, and like if you had the other situation, if you had a situation where Joe Biden won the Electoral College but lost the popular vote, then they'd do the other thing. Then they'd say it was constitutional. So, like, I don't think it's a good idea when you can't trust the courts mm -hmm. to be messing around with novel constitutional mechanisms because the, the, the courts are likely to make self-interested decisions. I mean, I mean it, it is a problem from hell. Um, and I, don't know, I have other thoughts that I want to get into, but I, I, will, I will save them for the next question. Okay. Yeah. Well, we do have a couple of audience questions um, that I want to get to, but... Before we do that, uh, just quickly uh, to make sure that we do get this into the space, is there anything that you would recommend that our audience here, again, this is a very engaged, active uh, community here in the city of Boulder. When we think about the question of restoring trust in our institutions and, and government, um, do you have a call to action? Like, What can we do as community members to restore voter confidence, respect, civility, and trust in our elections? I mean, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll take that one. I worry that we are living through a very anomalous period right now. And I mean, like, my opening remarks are about how we have structural problems with, with US democracy. I'm not disavowing any of that. But there is a global collapse in support for incumbent parties and for, you know, concerns about de democracy generally. And the reason why is because the post pandemic period sucks. You know, it doesn't. Just, it's not just that it sucks. It's that it's been worse than we thought it would be. You know, we thought after the vaccines came we'd get shot girl summer. Instead, we got eight percent inflation. 
And so what you're seeing is like, the United States is actually the best, is the best at performing ec economically, the best performing country in the world right now. And so Joe Biden, despite the fact that he's not very popular, is dunking on all of his peers right now in other countries. You know, Emmanuel Macron has worse, has worse poll numbers than him. Joe, um, um, Olaf Schatz has worse po poll numbers than him. Rishi Sunak has worse poll numbers th 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 than him. You know, in every, in, in, in every one of our peer nations, the incumbent party, regardless whether they're a left or right party, they're doing worse. In nations that have already have ele had elections, the incumbent party has lost. South Korea replaced its, you know, relatively, you know, it, it's fairly liberal president with a president who basically ran on sexism. Um, Italy replaced its, you know, liberal democratic government with a woman who, in fairness, has turned out less bad than we thought she would, but whose party derives, derives its intellectual lineage from uh, Benito Mussolini's fascist party. So we are seeing this national, this, this, not, this international collapse in support for incumbents and like doubts about democracy. And the reason why is no one's fault. We just lived through the single most catastrophic event since World War II. You know, getting back to good is going to take a while, no matter how well you, your nation is governed. And again, we are the best governed nation. We are the ones that, 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 that have done it best. And so like, despite the fact that I feel that there are structural problems with the government of the United, government of the United States, my biggest concern is that we do not have an exaggerated sense that because things are so uniquely terrible now, that it leads us to make the kind of mistake that cannot be easily reversed. You, you know, the, 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 the danger that we are living through right now, I mean, some countries it's going to be fine. Like, Rishi Sunak's gonna lose, he's gonna be replaced by the Labor Party, and the Labor Party is not gonna destroy democracy in Britain. You know, if Olaf Schatz loses, he'll be replaced by the Christian Democrats. The Christian Democrats are fine. But like, in our country, if the incumbent party loses, that is a mistake that is not easily reversed. And so like, I think it is important to like, have, be of two minds about this, to recognize the fact there are structural problems with our system that, that is causing people to be, uh, to be disaffected, well to also recognize that people are unusually disaffected right now because of circumstances that are not the fault of any politician. I want to make two main points. One is uh, a slight disagreement with Ian on the Electoral College. I'm not, you know, I don't really have super strong views, but I do think there are a couple points worth making to give a little more confidence in that system. Uh, the first being, we don't need a hypothetical on what a proportional house would look like in the Congress. We have one, and it's pretty back and forth, red and blue over the years, so I think that's interesting. And that is jarring about the 2040-84-16 uh, breakdown. That, that, is, that is stunning. I did not know that, so that's fascinating. But I, I think it's important to know that I also think campaign strategies would drastically change. I think instead of visiting rural Wisconsin, Iowa, North Carolina, Virginia, Georgia, Republican candidates would campaign in New York City, Manhattan, places they probably haven't been in decades, L.A. County, which has more a higher population than I think 26 states, L.A. County alone, 10 million people. So I think there are a lot, I think uh, campaign strategies would change, and I also think a lot of those, there are a lot of interests that aren't reflected in the population centers, whether those are farmers, a lot of interests we gained appreciation of during COVID, farmers, truckers, a lot of the professions that are critical to keeping this country cut, chugging along. And so I think those, re those interests are not reflected in population centers, but they're worth giving a lot of voting power. And also, I don't think New York, LA, and DC are lacking in institutional and cultural power in this country. I think they have plenty of that already. Now, in terms of, if I can on uh, restoring trust, as this question was, um, I think it's so hard to have trust with discourse as it is, where there's such demonization of both sides and in this in a caricature of both sides. I think it's a lack, I think it's ignorance. 
Um, I think it's people who live in cities talking about rural people as if they're, you know, mindless, hateful, want to kill everybody. And uh, people in rural cities who think everyone in, uh, or sorry, rural Americans who believe everyone in cities hates them uh, and wants to, you know, run the world according to George Soros and the World Economic Forum's bidding, and they're all reptilian. So I think there are a lot of ridiculous caricatures of both sides, and I think you cannot fix a democracy if you hate its people, and that and that includes half and half. So. Um, I have a couple thoughts. Uh, you know, one is that uh, I'll just confess that I think most polls are bullshit. Um, I think, uh, you know, they've been wrong and wrong and wrong. I don't know how these pollsters stay in business for the most part when they keep being so wrong. Um, you know, having, having talked with a number of pollsters, and I'm not a pollster myself, and there are some, there are some good pollsters, but it's like, you know, when you see a survey of 1,000 people, it's not really a survey of 1,000 people. It's like maybe 1,300 people that they surveyed, and then they remix it to get the proportion that they think is the proportion of Democrats, or they think is the proportion of independents, or they think is the proportion of Republicans and the, and the, and the age demographic, demographic. So they're basically sort of remixing it and getting, you know, and presenting a poll. Um, it's not an actual, like, if we polled you in this room, you're a small sample, but, like, this would be, like, it would be a poll which is not, which would be biased by the age and demographic, demographics of this room, so it wouldn't be very reliable um, for representing the population as a whole. So it's a, it's a complicated problem, but when you look at, like, in some ways the ultimate poll, which is the voting, going to the polls, uh, what you see, you know, notwithstanding these very worrisome global um, effects that Ian has talked about, in 2018, same congressional senate class in terms of the number the similar portion of democratic seats up its class it's, there's three classes of senate seats they come up you know every two years it was the same class as right now and democrats overperform the polls um, they were able to have a, a firewall against some of trump's excesses 2020 the polls you know kept you know really saying it, and it was close in some states there's no doubt it was close in some states but the polls you know underestimated the progressive vote 2022 uh, the Dobbs decision comes down. Kansas, red Kansas, you know, votes against this effort to try to um, make it harder for people to access abortion. Uh, you go into 2023, Wisconsin Supreme Court, by 10 points a victory over an anti-choice judicial candidate. Um, Ohio, massive dark money coming in from Leonard Leo and Dick Uline and these guys, and the people overcame it in order to protect their right to access abortion. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court race. You know, at, at every turn over these past, the, the significant election cycles over the past four, uh, going now on six years, the voters have not been aligned necessarily with those polls. and so. I mean, seriously, take them with a grain of salt. I think that they themselves do cause a lot of distrust. Like, like, what if you think you're reading a poll from Rasmussen, which is not credible, quite frankly, by the way, but Rasmussen, which is a Republican pollster that's always like goosing the numbers for the Republicans, and they say you're going to win, and then if you don't, your side doesn't win, you think, ah, oh, our election has been stolen. You know, it 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 causes a lot of um, dissonance, um, and so I, I so the cure for that is talk to more people get more people registered to vote, talk to another person, talk to the store clerk, talk to the grocery clerk, talk to the gas station attendant, talk to another student. You, the cure for this problem, the only cure we have given the structural challenges we have is getting more people to vote. Now you don't know how all those people are gonna vote, but what is the alternative? The alternative is to sit home and let uh, authoritarianism continue to be on the rise. Um, and, and I guess two other just quick, quick points, one is you know, to your question about suppression being a form of disinformation, the fact is, is that this, these suppression efforts have been well documented in courts of law through documented evidence from people who've studied how this voter suppression works and have, have documented the effect on voters of these measures. And the fact is, is that these suppression measures have a sort of Barbara Streisand effect which is you know, uh, famous for you know, libel and there's a reaction. When there was a reaction in Ohio to trying to suppress the vote, more Ohioans came out to say, hell no, you're not gonna suppress my vote. Georgia, tremendous effort to suppress the vote. People were like, no, I'm gonna stand in that line as long as it takes, even if I can't have water, because you are not gonna take away my vote. So the fact that the suppression, the, the actual suppression has not borne out is a, is a token or a, a representation of people's determination to not have their vote suppressed, not that people weren't trying to suppress it. And I guess the last thing I'll say is there are tremendous fighters who are fighting for reform and justice, and they are in Congress, like Senator Whitehouse or Senator Blumenthal, 
who have been investigating corruption, trying to redress the Supreme Court. There are tremendous fighters in both houses of Congress, in the state legislatures, who are trying mightily to overcome these authoritarian trends. And I just think we have to have some hope, um, as, a, as a hope and determination and action in order to overcome the challenges we face. Giving up, sitting down, uh, stepping back is not the solution. It will only lead to total disaster. That's my opinion. Thank yeah. you. So the question is how do we restore trust and what can you do as part of that as well as active community members? I am running a bill right now. It's a deep to prohibit, well, to curb the use of deep fake in elections. And a lot of you know what deep fakes are. They are digitally altered images of someone. A lot of times it's a false image and it, the person is saying something that is false. So currently there's a bill going through the legislature and what it does, if you're using a deep fake, you have to let the community know that, hey, this is a deep fake. Just so you know too, as part of the conversations we've been having is how, fa how far can we go when it comes to constitutionality and First Amendment rights. And I think someone just mentioned earlier that the Constitution is the biggest barrier to our democracy. And as you were talking, I was thinking about that. I was thinking, man, because there are people who said, you need to just ban deep fakes altogether. And we've considered it as, you know, to go as far as we can. But there are cons constitutionally, there are certain constraints because people do have the right to freedom to express themselves, to share information with one another. And if we are going to limit that, there are certain guardrails. Mm -hmm. And we've reached the limit uh, as it relates to that bill. So there has to be certain notice and also the Secretary of State, uh, we've expanded her authority in that space to, uh, to regulate it. So this is where we are. And I think for you, for me, my job is to create laws right and your job is to hold me accountable and your part of your job as well is to demand that i pass laws that protect our elections that protect our rights to vote but also you have a responsibility because now the world is much more complicated as we just talked about there's social media right social media people put anything up there they on twitter you find just about anything people say anything and with Again, with technology and deep fake, it's so easy to share messages, so easy to just take that post, send it to your friend, send it to your family member. So your responsibility your, and your job is to do your research. Before you send that post, do your research. Instead of getting your information from Twitter and Facebook, go to that candidate's website, check them out. There you can find the right information because you just don't know whether this is the real person or not. Because even though we have laws, there are people who are trying to skirt the laws. There are people who are going to put, put these deep fakes up. And if you are not careful, you will share that with your neighbor. Mm -hmm. So you have a responsibility as well. And that responsibility is making sure that you do your research and that you're accountable, not just to yourself, but to the people you're sending that information to. Thank, Thank you. you. That, that's great. And we'll pivot a little bit to audience questions. And we've got a couple of questions about the election model in Colorado and the election model in other states. And so questions around what are the biggest challenges remaining in Colorado? What do elections look like in other states? And so I'd like to speak really quickly to the election model in Colorado. Right now in Colorado, we are very fortunate. We are in the business of making one of the best election systems in the country better. We are working with leaders like Representative Joseph to continue refining and perfecting our model. So we're doing things and looking at language access and ensuring that even if in English is not your first or most familiar language, that you are voting in a language that is, and we're increasing tools for you to be able to do so. We're looking at how we better facilitate voting in jails. We're looking at uh, AI issues. We're looking at um, protections for election officials. So our model works, it's really good. It prioritizes security and accessibility. And that is true in other states across the country. And I think the biggest challenge that we have in front of us and something that we could use your help with is talking to your family members and friends in other states. We have to help election officials in Arizona. We have to help election officials in Georgia. 
And as part of my own training and learning over the last couple of years about what resonates well with voters in other states, there are three main messages that we need to keep hammering over and over and over again in those other states. Those are, one, there is bipartisan oversight in every single state in elections. Two, every single state has transparency requirements baked into their election model. And three, every single election official in the nation undergoes some sort of continuous training and some sort of uh, continual learning to better perfect how they do their job. And so if we all could just continue to hone in on those three messages when we talk to people in other states, that's really important. Yes, there was a, a request to restate them. One, there is bipartisan oversight in every state. Two, there are transparency requirements in every state when it comes to elections administration. Uh, meaning that, you know, there is, so for example, in Colorado, we are required by law to have a certification process on our elections where we produce documentation that demonstrates how the election was conducted. We also have a watcher program and watcher requirements. So any, anybody that's affiliated with a party or an, a ballot issue committee, for example, can come in and actually see the process for themselves. You can appoint watchers to go in and see how voters get checked in when they go in to vote. You can go and see how signatures are verified. You can see how tabulation occurs. There are steps throughout every single process where there is oversight and there's transparency, and that is for us primarily the watcher program, and we welcome those watchers. There's no election official that I've ever met that does not want to shine more light onto our processes, and that's true in Colorado, and that's true across the country. We are very proud of what we do. We believe in what we do, and we know what we do is accurate, and that it's accessible, and that it works. And so the more people that know that, the better. Um, and that is true across the country, and it's those three messages that have been um, shown to work and resonate really well across the country. So that's one thing that I would share. And the, a question from an audience member was, I'm curious about the election systems across the country. Do any of you know what other systems are like regarding security? Would you like to add anything onto that? I mean, I, th I think there's been a, a significant effort to try to address uh, some of the legal activity that has been alleged in Georgia, for example, accessing of voting machines by uh, people who were trying to establish ridiculous claims of bamboo on voting, you know, paper or whatever, the same sort of uh, nonsense that we were seeing in Arizona with these, you know, so-called cyber ninjas and these claims of fraud in Arizona that were debunked by bi a bipartisan set of election officials. So in some ways what you have since 2020 is a number of officials undergoing a lot of training, as you mentioned, to make sure that they, you know, uh, the process that the processes are transparent to make sure that people understand uh, how votes are counted that you don't have lies uh, being accepted as true like Giuliani claiming there's a you know a, a, a suitcase of votes coming in at the last minute when you actually have you know the counting of legitimate absentee ballots that in many states uh, Republicans were blocking from being voted being counted before election day having to be voted having to be counted at the end of the night and then claiming this was some sort of mysterious surge when it's just the result of refusing to allow those ballots to be counted at the beginning of the day. So I think we have a lot more awareness than we've had ever before. Um, and some states still have you know, some challenges. And in some of these places, people like Cleta Mitchell have been trying to stand up bands of people to go to try to intimidate um, election officials, you know, try to, you know, or, or people from voting perhaps, particularly in minority districts in Pennsylvania, for example, where we've seen some of this loose talk uh, by some Republican leaders or people who are adjacent to Republican leaders peddling that. I guess I would say for me, thinking about the longer term picture, you know, passing that John Lewis Act that was Act 1 in Congress last time around calling your members of Congress, your senator, your state reps, and urging them to support that John Lewis Act to restore the Voting Rights Act is one of the most important things anyone could do. It should be a nonpartisan, bipartisan, transpartisan issue to actually restore voting rights uh, protections in America that the U.S. Supreme Court by John Roberts destroyed, um, and more so, more additional reforms to try to protect the integrity of our elections, but also to try to make sure that people, people's votes are not uh, suppressed by this wave of voter suppression measures that John Roberts unleashed since that decision in Shelby County. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Any other reflections on that? I, I mean, I'll just add to what, you are already, you, what you've already said. Y'all are very fortunate in Colorado 
Colorado is considered the gold standard for like just making it really easy to vote. Um, and part of the reason for that is because like your vote by mail process was written by, I believe it was Amber McReynolds who was, hel used to hold your job in Denver, um, who, who, who took the lead in, in, in writing that policy. So it was written by actual election administrators who, um, who, who knew what they were doing. So it's like, the, you know, it's very easy to vote in Colorado. You all get your ballots in the mail. You have a long period of time. There's plenty of places where you can drop off your ballot if, if, if you want to do it. And like the states that do it well are the states that have adopted the Colorado system. I wanted to add yeah. that, um, yes, I think Colorado, we're doing, we can always do better no matter what we're doing as elected officials. We can always do better to, in, to ensure more access and more transparency and accountability in our processes and our systems. Uh, when I was looking at the AI bill, there were maybe 15 to 20 states who were also doing legislation in that space, and Michigan and New York were uh, two of the states who were looking very closely at the type of legislations they were working on to model our own legislation after as well. Great. Colorado continues to be a leader. <laughs> um, okay, we've got about 10 minutes left. I want to prioritize a student question. Uh, what are the best ways to conduct voter education? For example, many... For example, many of the immigrant community is new to this system and may even see it as unimportant because they also have a lot of other things going on. And how do you make it known that this system needs their vote to make a change? I'd be happy to, well, I, I'll just say that I think um, one of the things that we can do is over and over and over again say, we want you to vote and voting is easy in Colorado, here's the mechanics of how. I think the first time, when we think about young voters, the first time, or any new voter that you do something, it's overwhelming. And so we wanna make sure that we're in, in a relationship with young voters and all voters in our community to say, here's how you do it over and over and over again. Because by the time you do you know, vote three or four times, you've really got it down. You're gonna be a voter for life. Um, and so we want people to understand the process. I think it's a lot of mechanics. It's not necessarily always just who's on the ballot. I, we talk about that a lot. That's important, but it's also just how to vote. How do you register? When do you get your ballot? When is it due? Just those kind of basic education, um, that basic information is really important. But I would also say that we need to be clear as uh, election officials and as leaders that voting is not the only way to make a change in your community, and I think we do a disservice to other important um, avenues in creating change when we say that. Um, I'm the county clerk and recorder. I want you to vote more than anyone. Um, I will say it is one of the most uh, efficient ways to make change in your community, but it is not the only way. Whether you are going to be involved in organizing or protest or running for office or lobbying your local election uh, official, or I'm sorry, local uh, elected official, um, those all matter and are important, and voting is one way. It's easy in Colorado, and we're going to keep doing everything we can to uh, reaching out to those voters and making sure they're aware. But yes, please go ahead. Yes, I think that's a great question when it comes to access to the ballot box for or immigrant population. Here, I mean, I think the blue book is very helpful that we get before elections here in Colorado and ensuring that it's in another language. And also for elected officials like me, I, when I ran in 2019, my website was in Spanish as well. And this time around, and I haven't translated my website yet, um, but that's one commitment that I will make is that I will translate my website so that community members who do not speak English also have access to information in order to vote, in order to make the right decisions when it comes to voting. So yeah. access to information in other languages is very important. And one other thing that I wanted to mention, and I'm not sure if this is something you know all of us as community members uh, can do anything about, but maybe if somebody from the city of Boulder um, is listening is that Community connectors, in Boulder we have what they call community connectors. These are community leaders who are connected, they are a bridge between the city and the non-English communities. That's very important, these community leaders, because a lot of times when you think of people of color, when we think of government engagement, it's not always been positive. And it's, people don't always feel like they can trust government. 
So during elections as well, they don't trust their leaders because their leaders have not always been accountable to them. Mm -hmm. So we have to find key stakeholders within these communities to have them help us disseminate the information to them. So again, having reaching out to community connectors, and I don't know if you have that at the county clerk's office to also help disseminate information to these population to make sure that, hey, this is my neighbor and I can trust her, but I may not be able to trust the elected official, but I can trust my neighbor and because of my neighbor, I will vote. That's a great thought. And um, in Boulder County elections, we actually launched a Know Your Voting Rights campaign and effort several years ago. And the intention behind that campaign is to really affirm and lift up the diverse experiences in our community and intentionally ensure that those who have been historically excluded from our elections process know that we want them to participate. We have a resource on our website that targets these different um, uh, demographics. And so whether you're a member of the, uh, uh, the disabled community or your English isn't your first language or you're a young voter or you're someone that has been involved in the criminal justice system, we have a lot of different target audiences for this campaign. And what this does is it's a one-stop shop where you can go and see, okay, here's your rights, here's your resources, here's how to get in touch with us if you have any questions. So um, please go to our website, bouldercountyvotes.gov. It's called Know Your Voting Rights, and that's part of that effort. And um, we do work in coordination with community nonprofits here in Boulder County to make that program better and better year after year. We do have about five minutes uh, left. Uh, so Lisa, I hope you can answer this quickly and then we'll do maybe a minute or so per person for any lingering remarks. Uh, Lisa, are there any elected Republicans who are speaking out against author authoritarianism? Uh, there certainly are at the state level some uh, remaining who have been e expressed concerns, but mostly what we've seen is former officials. So uh, Michael Luddig, who many of you probably saw testify before the January 6th committee, um, who was a Republican judge on the Fourth Circuit. He was appointed by a Republican president, and he has really stood up strongly to um, address uh, that assault on our democracy, that violent insurrection on January 6th, but also the, the broader concerns that he's had. He's been a, you know, a real brave hero in that, and also the bulwark. I read it regularly. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, it, it provides a, a, a number of people who consider themselves to be conservatives, longtime conservatives, who um, have seen what's been happening with this, you know, rising sort of fascism as a bridge too far and have really come together to speak out against it. Um, so you have a lot of, an, you know, an actually large number of former Republicans or former Republican Party people who have um, expressed serious yeah. concerns. Um, but uh, if you are an elected official in Congress, um, you know, the people who have expressed concerns from that party have mostly left that party because they would be subject to a partisan primary uh, of people who are supporting this uh, more authoritarian approach where people, you know, I'm gonna declare martial law on day one, or I'm gonna have the troops in the streets to arrest immigrants. Like th this language is not an empty threat. It's a real threat and people who, who of conscience um, who have been trying to work inside Congress to resist that some of those members have left Congress because they feel like there's no way for that to prevail in the current climate within the Congress unfortunately you just saw it in this state with Ken Buck yeah yeah exactly Ian yeah Max, any last thoughts yeah I think that whenever we travel and we love to do in on the ground stories across the country whether that's going to a cannabis farm and Oregon to the East Palestine train derailment to the border in El Paso to Appalachia talk to ex coal workers and opioid addicts on recovery we hear such anger today and it's of course discouraging but I do feel as tried as it is that understanding the problem is key to navigating to solution and I'm always amazed at the level of anger and I think Dark forces are harnessing that anger in a way that's bad. But if we ever vilify the people, as I think a lot of people do in the media, and instead of looking at them as, say, losers in a lot of the major trends of the last 40 years who aren't bad people, but their towns have been devastated by forces of technological progress and globalization, and you read profiles of towns, you hear from people, the sunken look in eyes and all the sadness. And I also thought it was... Uh, uh, 
telling, going to cities as well and hearing the, the, the issues of trust that the representative highlighted um, where government has not been good to urban communities over the years. I remember in the vaccine rollout, we, w we went to uh, Philly and DC and we're based in New York and we do a lot of man on the street type interviews and you just heard such foundational distrust. So I think it's always important to remember with these issues that what may look like rage and blind allegiance and maybe it, both those things, but underlying it is not a moral flaw, but rather circumstances. And yes, people have harnessed out dark forces, um, but I, I would just encourage a culture of civility. I think every institution's accountable here. I think mostly about news and how it's fanned the flames of polarization and they feed audiences who already agree with them what they want and their businesses and nothing more and culture war and political theater sell so they've led to such division and i think it's affected the republican party it's stunning to hear that because it's true every every member of um the texas congressman will heard right yeah, yeah. Uh, romney pretty much anyone who dared dissent whether you agree with them or not excommunicated I think that is largely because of the red meat base that's slowly coalesced over the last 10 years, largely fueled by the media. So I think restoring a culture of civility, remembering that people aren't the enemy, um, and I think that starts, frankly, with, with the media. Mm. Thanks, Matt. Great. Okay, we are over time, but Ian, one to two minutes, or maybe one minute. Sure. Over one minute. <laughs> well, look, <laughs> I, I think whenever you face a daunting challenge, there's, there's two ways you could approach it. You, 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 you can either redouble your efforts or you can submit to despair. And like, American democracy faces a lot of challenges right now. I, I, I mean, you know, you got from my open remark, Joe Biden's gonna have to win this election by four or five points. That's gonna be tough. You know, there, there are a lot of daunting challenges. And I guess the only thought I could leave you all with is don't submit to despair. We, 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 we know how that ends. You know, do, do the other thing. Thank you. Love that. That's a wonderful note to leave us on, but I would ask our last two, any like very quick lingering uh, thoughts you want to leave us with? We are over time. I'll acknowledge that. <laughs> well, thank quick. you. The thing is, you are the most engaged people in our community, and you are here. Part of, again, I guess my ask of you would be next year, if we're having this type of event, think about who you can bring with you. Because again, the engaged people show up every time, yeah. and you do. But it's the ones who are disengaged who are not showing up. How do we get them involved? And it takes you, because you're their neighbor. You've been living in the same neighborhood for 10, 20 years, they trust you. So you have to bring them along as part of the process. So again, I think our democracy, it takes all of us, not just the elected officials. Mm -hmm. It takes all of us, each and every one of us in the community, to ensure that our democ democracy works for all of us. Thank you. Mm, wonderful. And Lisa, anything you'd like to round oh, us off with? Just thank you so much. <laughs> your stamina all day, <laughs> all these panels, all this talking. Yeah. Thank you for your devotion to making our world a better place. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.